Etiye fwone busi ya fwone diye kwa anso me ma obi biya akwa baba chani isu me pa chow a hai daily update tv ya ni diye kwa anso sene no first time baba chani isu wa mesra wuse uti edin sini wye nasi wone jomabe subscribe for more update like ni eshe ni usini usuma wala vese nye binti nyanku po nisha aso yes adin me pa chow wu wu comment ibin suwa constructively mesra wuse wad beche comment section ya beche ni akin kame pa chow sa comment section ya wu diya fashe ho wajun tre biya me pa chow fashe wane ya beche ni akin kame nyanku po nisha aso Oh yes, I didn't patch you moving straight into the audio and I see you zooming co tea audio woho. Now and sunny because I could tea and me patch oh um and and that was yesterday, yesterday, seventh January, ne constitution day. Na and ne ada and make us a seventh January be an ye ye at AC was a day. Yeah they be I say yeah they be celebrate ye constitution. Na because eh a kusi sunday into the events be bread and ain't man so na 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 em afarijan former easy chairperson afarijan em we pia babo nti de in sebi abetu ya wa sene a strong message ama je men sani de judiciary wa kan sempa and to wede men se omre me manen kwa esemena me kanti ebe kwa ni akuti afarijan in sema wadi ya tuja and sema wakache je men sa je men sa to as a like especially or what or the young kuni yung kuti in seven na said the man can no comment if you constructively fash a comment section nyanku punch out so yes I didn't that's people yung kuni yung kuti one two three uh elections the kind of democracy that Ghana opted for is one where the citizens choose their political leaders through free and fair elections it is true that there is much more to democracy than free and fair elections. But there can be no doubt at all that free and fair elections are not only the proper gateway to legitimate leadership, but they are also essential for good governance and democratic consolidation. Obviously, that makes the Electoral Commission a key institution in our democracy. However, that is not to say that the Electoral Commission is the most important factor in a democratic election. I think that this comes out clearly in a simplified definition of a democratic election as a contest among political parties or candidates mediated by an electoral commission and decided by the votes of the electorate. Based on this definition, voters come first, followed by political parties and candidates, and then the electoral commission in a ranking order of importance for the three main actors in a democratic election. <laughs> I think the justification for this ranking is rather straightforward. There can be no election at all if there are no candidates. And an election cannot be said to be democratic if there are no voters to decide the winner. For this reason, the primacy of the voter and the attendant sanctity of the duly cast vote are regarded as central pillars of the principles of electoral justice. The ranking also underscores the need for political parties to be closely involved in the electoral process. In this regard, I think that the Electoral Commission must view the Inter-Party Advisory Committee, IPAC, as a convenient forum for discussing changes to our electoral practices irrespective of whether the intended change originates from the Commission or the parties. The reason is that it is not good practice to foist changes in electoral practices, electoral practices 
on important stakeholders like political parties. It is prudent to discuss any intended changes thoroughly at IPAC meetings with a view to achieving consensus. If consensus is achieved, the IPAC then becomes a convenient vehicle for disseminating the changes to the electorate. Let me say that during discussions at the IPAC, the Electoral Commission is not bound to accept the position even if it is supported by all the political parties. It's not a voting matter. How many parties do we have? On the books, maybe about 19. How many, how many commissioners are there? Assuming that all of them go to that. seven. If all of them, then it would be 19 to seven. No, it is not that kind of matter. And the reason why they are not bound to accept some decision, even if all the political parties support it, is that the political parties can take a stand which constitutes an obstacle to the realization of the electoral rights of the people. When that happens, it is the duty of the Electoral Commission to uphold and protect the rights and interests of the people. I'd like to give a very simple example. The political parties once wanted the Electoral Commission to make it mandatory for people to produce their voter ID cards on election day before they are allowed to vote. The Electoral Commission said no to this no card, no vote campaign. Explaining that it is the Constitution and not the card that creates the right to vote. The card makes it easy to identify you as a registered voter. So on election day, if your name is on the register, which is the legal requirement, but you don't have from voter registration through voting operations to the collation of votes and the declaration of results. In doing so, it must pay particular attention to points where the election process is vulnerable to adulteration. I'm sure that the Electoral Commission is aware that most of the election controversies in recent times have centered on the counting and collation of votes. For this reason, I consider the setting up of regional collation centers in our presidential election to be a retrogressive step because it increases the number of points at which results can be manipulated. I understand that we borrowed the practice from Nigeria, surprisingly at a time when Nigeria was seeking ways to send results straight from the polling stations to one location. It is to be noted that Parliament approved the practice. The second requirement for achieving free and fair elections is a favorable external environment. In this regard, I have said many times that an electoral commission can make the best preparations possible for an election. But if the external environment is not right, the prospect for a free and fair election
can be likened to washing a piece of white cloth in milky water and hoping that it will not be stained. Unfortunately, several aspects of our elections are unacceptable because of murky factors in the external environment. And I want to call attention to four of them. First, violence. Some people say that violence in our election did not start yesterday. No. But instead of decreasing over the years, it appears to be increasing in both numbers and intensity. If our two major political parties are to be believed, they no longer have militias. If they are to be believed. But what is even more worrying is the allegation of the involvement of national security personnel in election violence. I'm afraid this is very serious and foreboding for our democracy. Two, disrespect for other candidates. Instead of mutual respect for other candidates seeking the same office, the tendency has been to show open disrespect for the other candidate and try by any means, fair or far, to portray him or her as unworthy of the office. Oftentimes, the same attitude is portrayed by the supporters of the respective candidate. In such an atmosphere, political campaigning loses its essence as an opportunity for candidates to tell voters what policies they will put in place to solve their problems and improve their conditions of life. Three, too many promises. In place of enunciating policies, our politicians spend a lot of time making and repeating promises to the electorate. One cannot be sure that even the politicians themselves believe that they can fulfill the, the numerous promises that they make. Anyway, they seem to forget that unfulfilled promises can be a millstone around a politician's neck. The negative effects can be devastating because even party members who were not part of the promise-making enterprise may find it difficult to extricate themselves from the effects. Four, vote buying. In days gone by, whatever vote buying or vote selling there was took place in secrecy. Not so these days. What we have now looks like an open market where candidates can freely buy votes and citizens can freely sell their votes in broad daylight while we all look on seemingly unconcerned. But it is a shameful spectacle because vote buying and vote selling are unlawful and they undermine two important principles that underpin our democracy. Vote buying undermines the idea that we choose our leaders out of our free will. And vote selling undermines the idea that we hold 
our elected leaders accountable through elections. I believe that our democracy is kaput when election results cease to be a true representation of our verdict on the performance of our leaders. And we cannot therefore hold them accountable through elections. And that precisely is what the emerging open market in votes portends. I'm sure that there are other factors about our elections that you may consider to be unsatisfactory. But the ones I have mentioned are enough to indicate that all is not well with our democracy. In fact, there are additional signs of the deconsolidation of our democracy. That is all I want to say about elections to now. I will now turn briefly to the judiciary. We will all agree that street protests and media wars are not appropriate ways of resolving disagreements over electoral matters. Neither can achieve authoritative and binding conclusions. Besides, street actions can be costly in terms of human and property loss. With regard to the media, it has become extremely difficult to distinguish between genuine media and counterfeit media because of the preponderance of one-sided, even distorted presentation of issues in the partisan media, the indiscretions of some serial callers, especially into radio discussions, and the irresponsible use of social media for political purposes. Nor do we know the impact that artificial intelligence will make on elections in view of its ability to create voices and visual images that are virtually indistinguishable from the real ones. Add to this the fact that election-related matters cannot be an exception to the rule of law. And you can readily see why the judiciary is an integral part of our electoral system. As a general rule, election cases are urgent cases that need to be decided as quickly as practicable. Except where the court genuinely does not know what to do in the particular situation. An example of such a situation occurred in Washington, D.C., in America. A candidate was officially sworn into office as a winner in the city council election when all the overseas votes had not been counted. Later, after collating the overseas votes, a different candidate emerged as the actual winner. The new winner went to court. But the case was not decided during the entire lifespan of the particular council, apparently because a situation like that had never happened before. And the court did not, did not know what to do once somebody had already been officially thrown into office. When the council's life ended, the case was dislodged on the ground that the substance of the action was vacuous. As far as I know, allegations of corrupt judges taking money to decide election cases have been rare in Ghana. 
However, in recent times, concerns have been expressed about the judicial function in elections. These concerns are encapsulated in two interrelated concepts. The judicialization of elections and the politicization of the judiciary. Judicialization of elections refers to the increasing trend of resorting to the judiciary to settle electoral controversies of all kinds. Politicization of the judiciary refers to appointing judges in the hope that they will give judgments that are favorable to a particular political party or cause if the need arises. As to which one comes first, it is like the chicken and egg question. It depends on which chicken or egg one is talking about. Is it the chicken that laid the egg or the egg that hatched into the baby chick? <laughs> so the sequence may differ from one country to another. What we can say for sure is that judicialization begets politicization and politicization begets and the end result is the same. Judges are embedded in the judiciary in anticipation of decisions favorable to a particular political party or cause. I do not know the extent to which judges are so embedded in our judicial system. I don't. But I find it noteworthy that even before the Supreme Court began hearing the 2012 presidential election petition, some Ghanaians were predicting a 6 to 3 verdict of the nine justices based on the number of panel members appointed by presidents of the two disputing political parties. The prediction did not come true, but it indicates that there was a perception that the decisions of our judges might be influenced by political considerations. Be that as it may, political influence aside, judges may give unsound decisions in election cases for two other reasons. The first reason is insufficient knowledge of elections. Judges are not necessarily experts in elections, and they may sometimes give judgments in election cases without realizing the full implications for the entire electoral process. This is often seen in injunctions and consequential orders. For example, a judge once placed an injunction on holding the district level elections. When some candidates went to his court complaining that there had been no voter education at all in their areas. The areas comprised only six electoral areas out of thousands of such areas in the entire country but the injunction unwittingly covered the whole country. So if the, the yes, if that helped, means we couldn't hold the elections. No, we have how many? I don't want to give you a number, but there are thousands of electoral areas. And we complain about six, and we put an injunction on the entire lesson, thousands of them. It's because he confessed to me later on that he didn't know. Uh, he confessed to me, you know, yes. 
he was one day, I went and sat with him, we were eating, we were having, you know, uh, we were having discussions with the judiciary about elections. And he was sitting next to me, I gave that example, and he said, ah, I'm the one. <laughs> he, he just didn't know. Similarly, um, a judge once ordered a recount of the votes in a disputed election result case. That also ordered that the ballot boxes could only be opened in the presence of the agents of all the four parties that were present at the initial count. All right. He's giving the order. Yes, you have to go back and count. Then he adds that you can only open the, the, the boxes when all the people are, you know, are there. As it turned out, hmm, the two parties not contesting the results were simply not interested in the recount and would not be present. But the judge had said we, we could not open the ballot boxes un, until all four of them were there. To a number of occasions, we will notify them, we'll go, and then only two parties uh, will be present. In, in such situations, the EC has to get the decision varied by the same court or by another court before it can act. The second reason for unsound judgment is what may be characterized as the lack of purposive interpretation of the law in full-blown um, election petitions. I'd like to spend a bit of time on this because this is not as self-explanatory as the previous one. To start with, let me give an example of what I consider to have been a, pop, a purposive interpretation of the law when I was at the Electoral Commission. A Ghanaian citizen then living abroad once walked to the Commission's head office and said he wanted to register as a voter so that he could vote in an election due to be held in about two months. It was explained to him that voter registration officially closed more than a month back. So he would have to wait till the next registration period. Not satisfied, he took the commission to court. And the court ruled that under our constitution, the right to register to vote is a fundamental right and it is not within the remit of the Electoral Commission to decide when citizens will enjoy their fundamental rights. I describe that decision as purposive because it was directed at achieving two goals both of which were consistent with the principles of electoral justice. The first goal was to preserve a citizen's right to register at a time of his or her choice, since registration or voting is not compulsory in Ghana. Comp registration is not compulsory. Voting is not compulsory. So the citizen maybe initially didn't see the reason why vote. All of a sudden, he said, hey, now maybe he should be able to register. This is what the judge will settle us. So it